So today we are finishing a series that we've been on called Rules for the Road. And the, the idea is that life is a journey. We're all on this road together, different, different journeys, but all on a road together. And we're trying to glean wisdom from the book of Proverbs so that we don't have to look back at our lives with regret or, or less regret, right? There's already things, if you're older than 18, you probably got a little bit of regret, but we can't live our life looking in that rearview mirror. You got to look through the windshield. So we're trying to learn so that we can live forward looking through the windshield of our lives. And so today I'm going to introduce another proverb, another rule for the road. Before I do that, though, let me just tell you about a trip that we took. Uh, about hmm, 16 years ago. So my wife and I, we, we're going to celebrate this year 30 years of marriage. And thank you. Thank you. Did you notice how I like paused just a little bit so you could do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, th- 30 years, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's a testament to an amazing wife and an incredible heavenly father. In 2007, my wife and our six kids. Oh, <laughs> see, now it's stuck. Our five kids felt that we were supposed to move to Hawaii. We were in a comfortable situation in Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, and we felt God calling us to move to do something here, to be here. Uh, So uh, when we told the people that we were in relationship with, they said, are you crazy? Life is good here. Your relationships are here. Your friendships are here. You have a nice home and a situation. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. It's good. Why why would you do that? Why would you go all the way? Can't you make it work here? And we just felt God calling us to move to a different place, to do something that was a little bit unknown and uncertain and had a lot of question marks around it. Uh, So we we went on this this journey together. And so we, we decided that in the moment it would be fun. We love to travel, so we thought it would be fun to drive cross country with our five kids from Franklin to Lake Tahoe where my parents live. And so instead of flying, we're going to do a road trip. We'll do it in five days, and then we'll reach Tahoe. So this is what our journey looked like. We set out from Franklin, then we went to St. Louis and Wichita, then Denver, then to Salt Lake and Lake Tahoe, and, and had, a, had a great time. It was so much fun. It wasn't that fun, though, at certain points during the trip. Have you ever gone like, that's going to be great? And then you do it, and you get halfway there, and you go, this is a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, but somewhere around between Wichita and Denver, if you've ever driven there, there's not a whole lot there. There's a lot of towns spread apart. When they say last gas is a few hundred miles, they mean last gas is a few hundred miles, so gas up. So as we're going through, the dust clouds started swirling, and they started to look like tornadoes. Now, we just come from Tennessee, which we had seen tornadoes and seen the devastation. We saw these dust clouds and it looks like tornadoes. And uh, to be honest with you, I started thinking, huh, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. And then uh, we had this big thing. It's called an action packer on the top of our car, just this big plastic case that holds your luggage. And the, the latch on the action packer broke. And so the wind would catch it and it would lift it up and it would come down and slam on our roof. So dust clouds are swirling and I'm hearing this. So like any husband, father, or man, if you've got trouble, the best way to deal with it is to speed up. Yeah. So I go faster, which only catches more wind, which causes it to thump on the roof. And it's thumping on the roof now really loudly. And I could see in the back, the kids like, you know, they're getting sc- And one of them, one of them starts going real quietly, we're going to die. <laughs> and, then, and then I didn't shut it down because you know what I was thinking, right? We're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> So he starts getting a little bit louder, and he starts saying, we're going to die. We're going to die. And then the others think it's fun, so they all start chanting together. <laughs> and then they're, they're yelling it in the car, we're going to die. We're going to die. And again, I'm thinking, we're going to die. This is, this is dumb. We didn't die. Yeah, we, uh, we, got, we, got, we actually made it to the one town that was on the road. It was at 5 o'clock. Everything was shut down. And there were, there, this is like one town, there's no lights. This is how small the town is. We find a hardware shop, and they, there's nothing else to do, so they're just shooting the breeze inside the hardware shop. It's closed. We knock on the door. They let us in. They let us borrow a drill, latch. We anchor everything down, and we continue on our journey. 
The temptation, however, was to settle right there and to stop the journey. In fact, for a split second, I thought, why are we leaving what we have to go do what we don't know is on the other end? And, and I, I think for us, when, when and, and you can probably attest to this, there are certain things in your life that you know that you want to do and maybe that even God is leading you to do. You go, you know what, I wanted to go back to school. And you get about halfway point and you begin to hit some quitting points in your own life. And you go, you know what, maybe I don't need to finish it. Maybe just here is good enough. Maybe it's with our kids. Maybe it's with our marriage. We all, we all have these places where we set off and we kind of have in sight a destination. And then something causes us, maybe it's discouragement, maybe it's fear, whatever it might be, causes us to go halfway and then just to stop halfway, to settle. It's good enough. So today, I want to help us live, and I believe God wants us to live with fewer regret. Here's our rule for the road. Don't stop till you get there. Don't stop till you get there. So, some of us are old enough now where we're living with the pain of remembering that I stopped 20, 30 years ago when I was trying to get there and I settled for here. And you live with that pain. I, we don't have to. There's a God who calls us into something greater. So I want to look today at our proverb as we start again. So the, the, the Proverbs is broken up into different sections, and three of these sections are what are called paternal Proverbs. In other words, it's like the voice of a father who's speaking to a son, telling him some important things in life. And there are ten of them. One of these is one of the most well-known ones. The other ones are, are significant and important. But one of these is in Proverbs chapter 3, and it starts off like this. My son, so it's kind of like a dad talking to a son. After all I've experienced in life, I'm giving you wisdom. And don't you wish you could go back to your 16-year-old self and tell your 16-year-old self something that you didn't know then that would help them navigate through their teens and through their 20s and 30s. And so this is the wise man, and he's telling this, you know, this son of his, he says this, trust in the Lord. And he qualifies it with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him or surrender to him or yield your decisions in your life and your future to him. And then he will do this. He will make your path straight. He will guide your steps. He will take you to the destination that he wants you to get to. But it begins with this, trust in the Lord. And that, if, you, if you're maybe new to Bible reading or you never read the Bible, when you see the word Lord in the Old Testament in capital letters, that is not just a generic name. That's not just like trust in God because, you know, we, we got this, this idea where everybody's trusting in God right now. I mean, pretty much everybody is, has some type of spiritual inclination. Everybody's trusting in God. Everybody's trusting in a religion. Everybody's trusting. But this is the personal name of God. In other words, God says there are a lot of things that people are trusting in and they think it's me, but I want to introduce myself to you. And he gives us his personal name, Yahweh. Yahweh. If you're Jewish, you, you know this. Yahweh. God, the personal God, the creator of everything, he introduces himself. And in Proverbs, he's trying to help people understand. And he's not just saying trust in religion. Don't trust in that guy. Don't trust in that girl. Don't trust in a method or a technique or because you go to church. Trust in Yahweh. Trust in me. And I'm going to be the one that will make your path straight. As you don't lean on your own understanding, and the reason why we don't lean on our own understanding is because we get ourselves in situations, all of us, where we don't understand what's happening in that situation. And if I navigate that situation based upon my limited knowledge, it's not going to go the right direction. So God says, look, 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 I'll give you something better. I'll give you my unlimited knowledge and help. Trust in me. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit your decisions, your desires, your will to me, and I've got something great, greater for you, and I will lead you and help you take every step to get you to your destination, the one that I have for you. It's a beautiful promise, isn't it? So today, I want to look at a guy who practically trusts in the Lord in a difficult place in his life. And I want to learn from that because God wants us to trust in him when we begin our journey. He wants us to trust in him in the middle of our journey. And he wants to trust in him as we go all the way to the finish line of our journey. The beginning and the middle and at the end. He wants us to start strong, get even stronger, and then finish great. Even though it might be a little bumpy along the way. 
And so I want to look at that scripture today in the context of a guy, his name is Abraham and his life and how he does exactly what we're talking about. So will you pray with me this morning as we just, Father, we, we pray, we need your help today to understand your word and Lord, what it looks like to live our lives in trust with you. Lord, what that looks like to go all in with you and to leave nothing unsurrendered. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think one of the reasons why this is real important is because, and I don't know if you're hearing this a lot, I'm, I'm hearing this phrase more times post-COVID than pre-COVID. And I don't think it is the best destination in life. And this is, this is what I'm hearing. You're probably hearing a lot. You go to a grocery checkout, and after you, get your, you pay for your groceries, they're going to tell you something like, be safe. Stay safe. I don't remember hearing that before COVID. I hear it all the time now. In fact, I hear a lot of people reducing their prayers to keep us safe. Keep us safe. Now, look, I am not against safety. That, that's that's not, not the point. But safety is not a destination. It's not a good destination. It's, it, it doesn't get us to move towards the adventure that we were really created for. Right. Theodore Roosevelt and, and others have said something to this effect. He said, most people, they tiptoe through life in order to arrive safely at death. We just kind of play it safe all the way through life to end up dying. And then we look back and go, was that it? Well, the reason why it was it, because we made destination safety. Now, safety is important, but safety is not the ultimate thing that we're living for. And if we do, I really don't think we're living in the way that God has created us. Because when God created us, I mean, think, think about what he did. God created us out of the elements of the earth. He breathed his life, his being in us, and we became animated and alive. Because of his breath in us, he gave us the gift of life. The reason why you're here this morning is because you have the gift of life inside of you, the breath of God inside of you. Then he takes us, he puts us in the earth to be in relationship with him. He wants us, and this is crazy. God says, I believe in you and I want you to partner with me to rule the earth. That's the destiny. I want you to rule the earth with me. And I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you can do it. You have the power to do it. And you're going to do it. And it's going to be for my glory. And you're going to take care of the earth. And you're going to take care of each other. And you're going to be like me in the earth in relationship. And we're going to do this together. We get to partner with God in doing this. That's crazy. It's definitely not safe, though. Crazy, but not. It, it, it's, an, it's an adventure. It's an adventure. Christianity, the ultimate priority in Christianity, it, it's, it's not safety. The ultimate priority in Christianity is actually not me, and it's not even you. The ultimate priority in Christianity is Yahweh. It is that Yahweh, the creator, gets the glory that he deserves for giving us life and creating us and inviting us to partner together with him. It's that Jesus Christ and his story gets told in all the world. It's that the good news of Jesus Christ gets proclaimed and declared in every nation in our community, not just here on Sunday morning, but as we leave on Sunday morning, go into our community, that the name of Jesus gets proclaimed, that his life, his death, and his resurrection get declared because without his life and death and resurrection, resurrection, humanity is separated from God for all eternity. Without his life, death, and resurrection, humanity is going to experience judgment. Without his life, death, and resurrection, humanity will experience damnation and hell in the grave. Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and resurrection are the only thing that can bridge the gap between a holy God and a sinful human being. The only thing. And it restores us and brings us back into relationship with him right now and for all eternity. Whoo! And God calls us to partner together with him in seeing that mission fulfilled. He does not have safe in mind. He has adventure in mind. He has adventure in mind. But not safe. He, he invites us to risk and to trust him and to go beyond what is safe. In fact, th this morning, if, if, you, if you, you're, you're thinking or your experience is that, man, Christianity is kind of boring, 
Let me just make a suggestion. It might be boring because you've forgotten what the real destination is. Because when the destination is to partner with God and ruling the earth and communicating the good news of Jesus Christ that transforms lives in all the world, how in the world can that ever be boring? That is always just like, Whoa. <laughs> So all I could come up with in the moment. So I want to look at a, at a guy named Abraham who finds himself in literally an impossible situation, a situation uh, that is beyond him and that requires of him to take incredible risk, risk and the practical way that he does that. And I want to invite us to, to follow his steps in, in doing this. And there, there's some things that you need to know. So here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, this is Hebrews, the, the author of Hebrews is just kind of summarizing Abraham's journey. And he says this, by faith, Abraham, when, he, when, he, when called to go to a place, he would later receive his inheritance. He didn't know where it was. He was just called to go. He obeyed and he went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Even though he didn't know where he's going. I mean, here, here's basically what happened. God comes to him and reveals himself as God over all of creation and basically says, I want you to come follow me to a place that I want to give to you. And I'm going to do something in this place that I'm going to give to you. I'm not going to tell you where. All I want you to do is to give me your yes. Will you do it? And I, I think God over and over, he just comes to us and just goes, will you do it? Will you just give me your yes? In fact, what he's trying to find out from Abraham is, Abraham, do I have your unconditional yes? In other words, not after you have all the details and not after all the difficulties are removed and not after it seems like it's possible, but before you know anything, will you give me your yes? In other words, will you just go all in with me? Just give me a, a blank check. What, what, what's it going to cost me? I don't know. Just... <laughs> Do you tr and here's the question, do you trust me? Do you trust me enough to give me an unconditional yes? He asks that over and over, and I, I feel like he comes and visits us all the time. He's trying to figure out, because I think what's most important for him is, will you trust me? Can we have relationship together so that we can partner together? And I can do something in you, but I want to do something through you as well. And so before we, we get to what it looks like to give God our unconditional yes and to go all in with him, I want to look at Abraham's father because I think Abraham's father had a chance to give God his unconditional yes, but it seems like he stopped short of going all the way to the final destination that God had for him. And so in Genesis chapter 11, this is Abraham's father is a man named Terah, and this is what it says about Terah. Terah took his son Abraham, or Abram at that time, his grandson Lot, of Haran and his daughter-in-law Sarai and uh, the wife of his son Abram and together they set out from Ur of, everybody say Ur, Ur, Ur all right, Ur of Chaldeans to go to Canaan. So we'll put up a map and on that map, that green box right down there, that is where Ur is at. It is in the lower part of Mesopotamia and then, you know, if you were to go directly across there is a pin drop. And that pin drop is the land of Canaan. It is present-day Jordan. And so go from Ur to Canaan. Now, we're not really told why he's told or why he has this idea to go there. There are two really, really prominent ideas. One idea is that God, because God is going to call uh, Abram, his son, to do the exact same thing. So one idea is that God actually showed up to Terah first and told him, I want you to go to this land. And then there's, there's probably a really good reason why. Because remember, at this point, God is unfamiliar to everybody on the face of the earth. So they're worshiping everything. And, and Ur is a place where they're worshiping a moon god. They're pagans. They're mo worshiping moon gods. Basically, Torah is a worshiper. He's a pagan, and he's worshiping the gods of the area. And God is bringing them to their own place outside of the influence of where he is right there. The, the other thought is that maybe, because when Stephen, this guy named Stephen, recounts the story of Abram, he says this, God spoke to Abraham when he was in Ur. So 
possibly, and I think this is, this is probably what happened, God spoke to Abraham while he was in Ur, and Abraham told his daddy, Terah, God, the Lord, I don't know who he is, but he told me that we're supposed to go to the land of Canaan. In any case, Terah responds to the call, and he goes. But this is what happens in verse 31. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. They didn't make it all the way. They stopped. They settled. I'm not sure why they settled. Could have been discouragement. Probably the same reasons why we settled, right? We get halfway in our journey, and it gets discouraging sometimes. We have setbacks sometimes. Sometimes we just get afraid because now we can see a little bit further into the land. We've gone 600 miles to the land of Haran. we still got 400 miles to go, and that first 600 miles, that was hard. So things are good here. We get distracted. And I, I think this is the biggest one. We just get comfortable. It's a lot easier to settle where it's comfortable than it is to push on because I know it's going to be hard in this unfamiliar land. And so for whatever reason, we're not really told, he settles there. And this is what it says. This is how basically the story of Torah finishes. He lived 205 years and then he died in Haran. That's it. He never quite made it. He, he almost made it, but not made it. Almost will get you to Haran. All in will get you to Canaan. And so he goes almost to that place. And to be honest with you, do we really love almost in life? I mean, is there, I, I almost won. I almost graduated. I almost got that scholarship. I, we, we almost got that new job. Oh, it's like, mm, almost, I, I, I used to, I would say about myself, I almost had a relationship with God. I almost was going to heaven. I mean, it was only 16 inches, but that 16 inches is a long journey. That 16 inches is the difference between my head and my heart. I, all, I, I knew so much about God here, but in order to get him here, I had to go all in. Almost wasn't enough. Almost got me here. All in gets you here. So for most of my life, I lived almost. And then it wasn't until I went all in that I got this. And that changed everything. I, how, how, I mean, it, it would be so, such a bummer for me to be able to say, I almost married Chris Galka. That's my wife now. I, I almost married her because if I had almost married her, then I would not have a family of five children. If I almost, I'm going to remember. <laughs> if I almost married her, I would not have the joy or the place or the incredible blessings in life that I have. But in order for me to marry her, I had to go all in with her. And in order for us to experience the blessing of God and to be able to make it to the destination that God has for us, we have to give him our unconditional yes and go all in with him. Almost will get you maybe halfway. All in will get you to where God wants to get you. So here's now Abraham's story. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And so I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Now, the, the important thing for you to know is that when God comes and tells him this, he is 75 years old. And his wife is 65 years old. Now, I know El Pacino just had a kid. And he's, <laughs> however, this, the, they're, they're older, right? Just trying to think of a way to say it. You, you, People don't have children at this age. God promises them to make them a great nation. They don't even have a child. And then he goes on to say, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse the one who curses you. And all the people, here's his big point, you get to partner with me and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. This is not primarily just about you, Abram. This is primarily about what I'm going to do through you. And I'm inviting you to play a part in this. So the only way for you to do this, Abram, is to go all in. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram, 75 years old, he set out from Haran. He set out from Haran. He took his wife 
Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions and everything that had accumulated and the people had acquired in Haran, they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. They didn't just set out and cut it short. They arrived there. And I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been with all the stuff they had, all the family they had, all the possessions they had to get to where they're going. But they arrived there. The blessing of God is when we go all in with him. That's where the blessing is when we give him our unconditional yes. And God is inviting each one of us to, to come. I've got something amazing that I want to do, not only for you, but through you. And the only way that we get to that place is by saying, God, you have my unconditional yes. I am all in with you. And when we do that, God does what only God can do. So what does it look like, though? What does it practically look like to give God your unconditional yes. What does it look like to go all in with God practically? And so I'm going to look at just three things this morning that it looks like, and this is the first one. God is going to continually come to us, and he wants to know, do I have your yes when you don't have all the answers? Do I have your yes when you don't have all the answers? By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go, this is what he did. He went, and he later, he obeyed, and he later received, I'm sorry, Go to the place he would later receive his inheritance. He obeyed. And here's the big thing. He obeyed even though he didn't know where he was going. He, th that, is, that is so counterintuitive for us, right? Because what do we want to know before we take a step in any direction, most of us? Where are we going? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I thought that was my head, but then I realized it was, it was you saying that. Yeah, where, where are we going? I, I want details, right? What, what's, the, what's the question that gets couples into fights on Friday, Saturday, Sunday night? Let's go to dinner. Where are we going? Oh, it's on. <laughs> and we spend a bunch of time doing that, and then we finally go, you know what, forget it already. <laughs> forget it. Where, where are we going? I want to have some details. And if I go, what's going to happen there? I want to know before I go. And then I want to know during the path that you're going to get me not, and here's our secret prayer. I don't just want to go to where you want me to go. I want to go where I want to go. Right? And God says, come where I want you to go. And we go, okay, is that the place I want to go? Just come. And he calls Abraham out of certainty. And he gives him the opportunity in the midst of certainty to trust in the Lord. And in this moment, Abraham gives God his unconditional yes. Before he knows all the details, before he knows how this thing is going to turn out, where it's going to end up, before he knows anything, he says yes to God. And God is going to do the same thing with us. There are going to be moments in your life that God is going to call you to do something that doesn't make sense, and he's not going to give you a whole lot of details. And you're going to want to know, I want to know what the next step is. And he'll say, you know what the next step is? Next step is for you to trust me and to just take the next step that I show you. I, I found this to be true just in my life. This is totally anecdotal. If I had known what was going to happen on the other end of my obedience to Christ, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to be able to do what I've, what I've done in life. So you know what God says? God says, I, I realize that. So I don't want you to have the faith for the end. I just want you to have the faith for the next step. Can you trust me with the next step? Can you just come when I say come? And so God is going to trust, test us by allowing us to be in places where he calls us out of uncertainty. And then God wants to know, do I have your yes when things get difficult or uncomfortable or unfamiliar? And so when he tells Abraham... To come follow him, this is the detailed version in Genesis 12. He says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I can imagine Abraham has all kind of questions for God. Because this is an uncomfortable situation. Because in this era of the world, to leave your people, to leave what is familiar, to leave the safety of your tribe, was to put yourself at harm's, in a harmful situation because all the other tribes, they were not out for you, they were out for themselves. And so if you left your tribe, that left you exposed, vulnerable, and in a really uncomfortable place. And 
I'm sure Abraham was going, God, really, do you know what you're doing? Because you're saying I'm going to be a father of many nations, but if I leave my people and my country and my place, I'm not even going to live to see it happen, to see a child happen. I'll be killed before that. And so God calls him out of his comfort. There are going to be times when God calls you and I out of our comfort. And, and here's, here's one of the reasons why. It is not to hurt you or to harm you. It is to cause you and I to be blessed and to grow. Comfort is not a catalyst for growth. It's just not. It doesn't speed up growth. It doesn't cause us to grow. Th this is why one of, one of the things that, you know, nowadays people are, are doing uh, uh, is they're really pushing themselves mentally to, uh, to a new extreme and shocking, in many ways, shocking their body. This is the idea behind the cold shower or the, the cold plunge is that we introduce into our system something that is uncomfortable and shocks our system so that when we engage with the normal stresses of life, there is a resilience that is built up. Something is built up inside of us. Something grows inside of us. Perseverance grows. Endurance grows. And so James, in James 1, he says, is consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials and testing of your faith of various kinds, because you know that the trials and the testing of your faith, they produce perseverance. And then let perseverance have its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. There's a process. Our growth, we, we, we just want growth to happen. And God says, the, the way to growth it is testing the way to growth. It is trials the way to growth. It is difficult, this uncomfortable things. That is the way to growth. If you look at the people in your life that you admire and you see the strength of their character, it's probably there not because they live their life in comfort, but because they had incredibly difficult circumstances that they learned to persevere and trust God through. That is the way of life. And so God calls Abram out of a comfortable environment into an uncomfortable environment, and he wants to know, once again, do I have your unconditional yes? In other words, do you trust me? Just trust me. And then finally, this last one, God wants to know, do I have your yes when it looks impossible? Do I have your yes when it looks impossible? Now, the Apostle Paul, looking back many years from this situation, he records his perspective of it, and this is what he says in Romans chapter 4, verse 18. He says, in hope against hope, he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So when God first shows up to Abram, he is 75. By the time that God is actually going to now do what he promised Abram, which is give him a child, he is 99 years old. Everybody just say 99. 99. Okay. Al Pacino is 81. 99. I'm just not sure. Not only is he 99, but Sarah at this point, she's almost 90 years old. Now, can, can you imagine all the questions? I mean, this is not just like, huh, that's probably not going to happen. This is like, this is impossible. This, this is not going to happen. Can, can you imagine? I mean, guys, when guys look in the mirror, they always see something a little bit different than is really there. You see, imagine Abraham looking in his mirror going, well, okay, I guess I'm not that old. No, you're old. <laughs> you're 99 years old. And I'm sure he was complimentary to his wife and he loved Sarah. I appreciate you staying in good health all these years. You look great. Thank you so much. But you old too. <laughs> we old. We're, we're past probable. This is impossible. Unless Yahweh who called us makes this happen, this ain't going to happen. Some, some of us in our lives, when we hit these impossible moments, what we do is we put a period at the end of the sentence. And if Abraham would have done that, it would look like this. He contemplated his own body now as good as dead, and the deadness of Sarah's womb since he was about 100 and she was almost 90. Period. And we go, I guess it just ain't going to happen. I guess God isn't going to be able to get me to where I felt like he was calling me to be. And some of you are living with a period at the end of a sentence that was not meant to have a period. It was just meant to highlight that when God comes through, you will realize how much this was God coming through and this was not just you. 
But you have a period right now, and God, I think, would have you wipe that period out, give God your unconditional yes, go all in with him, and let God turn that period into a yet, because that's really how the sentence reads. Abraham considered the deadness of his own body and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet there was something greater at work than the impossibility of the situation, and it was the God who was leading them through this situation. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, yet with respect to what God had said, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, and he even began to give glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to do. I may not be able to do this, but he promised it, so I guess the burden falls on him. He didn't say, come do this in your own power. He said, come do this, and I will, in partnership with you, make it happen. So we do what we can do, and we got to let God do what only God can do. And so Abram begins to worship God. This is how we know he gave God his entire unconditional yes. Even though he was at a place where most people put a period and say, it can't happen, Abraham said, yet with respect to the promise that God has made, and yet with respect to the God who made that promise, I believe that what he promised, it will come to pass. And God is going to oftentimes lead us into places, maybe some of you are in a situation right now, you can't fathom how it will ever happen. And in those moments, do what Abraham did. Instead of trying to figure out the how, he trusted the who. Trust the God who made you the promise. Trust the God who's leading you through the promise. Trust your heavenly Father to do what only he can do. I, I'm going to just finish with just a, an interaction that I had with one of my, my kids. It really helped me understand what God is inviting us to. So, you know, you know, when your kids are little, my kids are, my kids are all adults now. They, they were little. That was such a fun season of life. And primarily because they just want to be with mom and dad all the time. And honestly, they still do. And they just want to, they just want to help out. And uh, not, not so much anymore. But when they're little, they just want to be with mom and dad. just want to help out. just want to show you how capable and how strong they are. So oftentimes, when we come home from the grocery store, they'd say, you know, I, I'd ask them, do you want to help us? Do you want to help daddy with the groceries? And I remember one time my daughter said, yes, dad, I do. Because she just wants to show how capable and how strong she is. And she's about three or four years old. And so, you know, this was back in the day when we had plastic bags and stuff like that. And she, she, I'd say, can you, can you get it? And she'd go, yeah, I got it. Would you like dad to help you? Yeah, you can help me. So, and so I, I'd try and grab it like this and walk with her like that. And she'd go like, no, 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 no. You grab your side and I'll grab my side and we'll do it together. So she's about three or four years old. So I grab my side and she grabs her side. And you can already see things are not going to go well. And so you do what all dads and moms do. You, you, you don't let them know this, but you're really the one carrying the bag, right? And as we're going awkwardly together, doing this thing together, uh, you know, we, we finally get into the kitchen because during the journey like eggs have been coming out and fruit's been rolling down you know and I'm carrying the bag and we're picking up stuff as we go you know you're managing the project with them you're you're, and, and really you're doing the work she thinks she's doing the work but really I'm doing the work so we finally get in and she you know we put it on the ground she looks at me and throws her hands up we did it you know we did it we did it and really, I did it. I was carrying the bag. I was managing the project. And I was making sure that we got it there. I did it. She just gave me her yes. She just gave me her yes. Do you realize that in life, regardless of how much you think, we did it, he really does it. He really does it. And all he's looking for is our yes. And we give God our yes. He really does the heavy lifting. And we get to participate with the Heavenly Father. You know, the the beauty of that moment was not the, you know, just the flawless way it went down. The beauty of that moment is that my daughter wanted to participate with me. 
So for me, so much joy. And your Father in heaven has so much joy when you participate with him. And all he's looking for is a yes. He just wants you to say yes. Wake up tomorrow and say yes. When he invites you into something that seems overwhelming, know that you have a good Father who's with you in it. And he just wants you to say yes. Do it with me. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we, we are so grateful that you are... Lord, you're that kind of a God that you invite us to participate, to partner with you in doing something that we can never do on our own. And Lord, you support us in it. And Lord, you really do the heavy lifting. And all you're asking for is a yes. All you're asking for is a heart that will just go all in with you. I want to invite some of you who are just in a, in a, what you feel like is an impossible situation, just a difficult moment. Maybe you've gotten halfway to where you feel like you're supposed to be going and you're getting tired or you've been discouraged or you've had some setbacks. Or, or maybe like almost all of us, we just get distracted and we get comfortable and it's hard to move on from where we are. But you sense your father saying, come on. Don't stop. I want to invite you, would you just give him your yes again? Would you just go all in with him again? No, no guarantees on the future other than God says it's going to be good and I'll be with you in it and we'll be together doing something significant. So if that's you, would you just give him your yes? Just take a moment right now just tell him, yes, God. I trust in you. Lord, we give you our imperfect faith. Lord, where we are right now, as much as we can just say yes, we just say yes to you. We don't want to be almost, we want to go all in. So Lord, we're all in with you. And God, I pray that you would do what we cannot do in this situation. Lord, to carry us through it, to get us through it so that together we can move toward what you have for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us at the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you'd like to receive more sermons or content, please subscribe. And if you'd like to give, you can give at gracehonolulu.org. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.